Welcome everybody to the Quarantine-ish Book Talks. I am Judith Rosenbaum of the Jewish Women's Archive. I'm really excited to be with you here tonight. If you are new to JWA and to our Book Talks, thank you for joining us. If you've been with us for months, which actually feel like years at this point, welcome back. Uh, this is a good place to be. Um, I want to thank the National Endowment for the Humanities for supporting our online programming, and I want to thank Jewish Live for their partnership. Uh, for those of you who may be new to JWA, we are a digital archive that helps expand the Jewish narrative by documenting and sharing Jewish women's stories. We delve into history as a framework for understanding the issues that are important today, and we'll be talking about a lot of those issues tonight. So the quarantine book talks are just one aspect of JWA's work, um, and I hope that you will check out JWA.org to explore the full range of programs and resources that we offer. One moment of logistics before I introduce our author for tonight. Please, as I said, introduce yourself in the chat box and also put your questions there. I will be sure to bring them into our conversation. Um, when you're chatting, make sure that you chat to panelists and attendees so that everybody can see what you're saying. I am delighted to introduce Talia Lavin. She is a freelance journalist who's written about the far right for many publications, including the Washington Post, The New Republic, GQ, The Village Voice, and many more. Uh, she's the author of the excellent book that we'll be discussing tonight, Culture War Lords, My Journey into the Dark Web of White Supremacy. And a little known fact, she was also at one point the voice behind JWA's Ask Emma advice columnist from Emma Goldman. Welcome, Talia. Hi, yeah, I was just going to mention my brief JWA foray was as my first advice column was pretending to be Emma Goldman and solving, um, solving all kinds of reader problems. Emma Goldman's a big inspiration of mine and a, a great Jewish woman of history that JWA has highlighted. And I really love JWA's uh, resources on, on otherwise erased Jewish women, especially like a lot of us have kicked a lot of ass when it comes to labor history, it turns out. And um, that's fantastic. Yeah. So, Emma's yeah. one of my favorites too. I often think what would Emma do? Uh, and if you start out as of the voice of Emma Goldman and advice columnist, I don't know where you go from there in terms of advice columnist. So, you know, <laughs> good thing well, that you've gone to white supremacy. Yeah, you go on to write a book about um, fighting Nazis. Right. So that's what I did. And I'm delighted to be here. And um, shout out to my relative, Volunia, from Boston, who I think is here. Um, oh, I love Volunia. I know Volunia. Hi. Welcome. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I, I want to start, first of all, just by thanking you for your bravery in writing this book. I have to admit that even to read this book felt a little bit scary. It's been sitting, I, I got it months ago when it first came out, and I was sort of like, had a little trepidation about reading it because I feel like in recent months, my reading has mostly been to kind of escape from the world that we're living in, not to delve into its ugliest parts. Um, so given how scary I found it to read. I mean, I loved it. I think everyone should read it. Um, but I can't even imagine what it was like to write it. So I think my first question is really, how did you come to write this book? Or to put it an even finer point on it, how does an anti-fascist Jewess come to spend a year deep in the underground of online white supremacist communities? Well, um, you know, I, I when I answer this question, I say, you know, the Nazis, I didn't come to the Nazis, the Nazis came to me. You know, I I first started writing about the far right after the Unite the Right, um, the deadly rally in Charlottesville. And I wrote a piece actually about how a neo-Nazi tabloid called the Daily Stormer uh, kept up its web hosting. You know, I and I kind of did the ultimate little twist and I said they were like, like Jews in the wilderness because they kept having to hop from host to host and 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 naturally they and that was when I was at the New Yorker and so uh naturally they noticed and wrote this big piece uh calling me a fat greasy kike um which is still I'm still the top search result for that so every girl's dream and at that point you know I think some people would have turned away and said I'm not going to write about this too much harassment whatever but I'm stubborn and stiff-necked in the best tradition of our people. And um, I decided to dig in deeper. I mean, I was sort of interested in the human motivations behind it. And, um, you know, I'm a granddaughter of Holocaust survivors and uh, it's tr touched my family very directly. And so, you know, I'm not gonna deny that both history and anger were big motivations and 
in sort of delving deeper. Um, I wanted to understand the fringe. I wanted to understand where they were coming from because I feel that in any struggle, and to me, it is a struggle. This wasn't a dispassionate, this book is not a dispassionate examination of the far right phenomenon. It's a guide to fighting in my understanding of it anyway. And uh, I, um, I wanted to, I don't know, be the teenage girl that fought back. And how, how hard was it to figure out how to infiltrate? I mean, it seems like you were able to go deep into a lot of different communities and, and there is, there are sort of very particular aspects to it. There's, it has its own lingo. Every community has its own lingo. It has, it, a lot of these places are sort of not necessarily in the, out there in the open where you would find them. How did you find the process of actually, you know, delving in? Well, um, you know, it was interesting because there was a big platform shift in the middle of my writing in 2019. So this was after um, the mass shooting in El Paso, which was, you know, by some accounts, the second or third mass shooting inspired by the specific platform 8chan. Uh, and 8chan, it's an anonymous website that people can use, but several mass murderers had uploaded manifestos and um, the shooter at the the um, synagogue in Halle, Germany, actually live streamed himself shooting people, an attempted attack on a synagogue um, on 8chan. And so 8chan was shut down midway through my research and there was this mass migration to Telegram. They kind of had a sense that 8chan was going to be shut down and started posting these channels that they were gathering in on the encrypted chat app Telegram. And so I started, I made a sock puppet, which is sort of a, you know, it had an, an innocuous white sounding name and a little neo-Nazi symbol, like a black sun I used as my icon. And I just started squatting and listening, eavesdropping. Uh, when people sort of said, you have to say something or you'll be kicked out, I said stuff. But, you know, it's like any language you learn by listening. Uh, immersively. Unfortunately, it was kind of immersive. Um, and so, I mean, it's, at the same time, it's not that deep. It's like throw around a few anti-Semitic slurs and you can get in, you know, uh, pay attention for a day or two and you know what they sound like. So just try not to stick out. Uh, it felt grotesque. And I will admit, one of the quirks of it was that I felt more comfortable being anti-Semitic <laughs> than like uh, saying other racial slurs or whatever. Uh, of course, I didn't talk that much. Mostly I was eavesdropping, but uh, I was like, if I'm gonna slur anyone, like it might as well be my own people. Cause I, I know I don't believe this. I don't know. Uh, everyone has their own strategy for approaching this, this stuff. I was surprised to hear that um that Yiddish words are used as part of the lingo in some of the white supremacist communities. Yeah, they're really, really into the word goyim. They think that, I mean, first of all, that that has a long history. If you actually read the protocols of the, of the elders of Zion, which I have read all 112 pages of, although don't quiz me, it's long and horrible and repetitive. Um, there's constant use of the word goyim um, as sort of a signal of like we know you know, Jewish culture, right? Or, or passing it off as an authentic document. But so that tradition of kind of obsessively using the phrase goyim, there's this phrase, the goyim know that they use all the time, or the goyim are noticing what you're doing. And it's meant to sort of menace and intimidate Jewish people from this perspective of like, we are using your terminology. So they use the word shoah all the time also, which is, you know, a Hebrew word for Holocaust. But, you know, they'll use it, um, in a trivializing way. So the sort of standard neo-Nazi parlance for being kicked off a social media platform is being show up. Um, or whenever a Jew is talking about anti-Semitism online, a very popular response is, oy vey, another show up. Um, you know, often with like anti-Semitic imagery attached to that comment. So it's sort of using the language of Jewish speech to mock Jewish pain it's sort of imputing this idea of like, 
we know all about you and your nefarious plans from the inside. And, um, you know, there's an obsession with like one or two passages from the Talmud that they sort of say, like, prove all Jews are pedophiles and they'll like quote them at you, you know, with this idea of like, we have insider knowledge and they don't. Um, if they did, they'd know the word goy is like not even derogatory most of the time. It literally just means Gentile. Right, or nation or whatever, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it just means nation, colloquially, colloquially Gentile. It's like, sometimes it's slightly derogatory. It's like if they were going around calling themselves the, a shagitz, then you would know they knew what they were talking about. They don't. Right. Um, you, you said right up front, like, this is not a dispassionate you know, investigative approach. Um, you're a journalist um, and you spent, you know, more than a year living in this culture to research this book. Uh, but you also engage in some of what you would describe as anti-fascist activism, basically infiltrating not only to learn about the groups, but also, also to expose members. So how did you think about your work and sort of like what your goal was in writing this? Did you think about yourself you know, how did you think about that relationship between journalism and anti-fascist activism? And how did you, how did you find yourself in those roles? You know, it is, uh, it is sort of an interesting thing. I think uh, my own answer is sort of tied up in my own objections to the fetish for sort of journalistic objectivity that people have, like that you have to sort of present yourself as if both sides are equal. And I felt like, you know, I'm going to start from a viewpoint where I say it's okay to oppose the far right, to oppose it vocally, to oppose it uncompromisingly. I don't feel that that makes my facts compromised in any way. Uh, and indeed, since I've published the book, not one uh, person who's been mentioned has raised an objection factually. Um, you know, and, and, uh, I did hire a fact checker as well out of my own pocket. <laughs> um, you know, to me getting the facts right is extremely important. Um, on the other hand, I don't feel a need to sort of offer a mealy mouthed sense that I don't care because I very much do just as journalists who cover climate change are often very passionate about climate action. Uh, I feel that, you know, detoxifying our social atmosphere is important as well. And um, no, I, you know, I wrote the book from a personal perspective in order to sort of obviate that need to, I don't know what, like pretend that this, that I don't see it as a problem to fight. I, I said very honestly from the start, I hate the far right. <laughs> I started out hating the far right. I just got to know it better and I hated it more. I'm the granddaughter of Holocaust survivors. I grew up Jewish. I am a big old Jew with big old Jewy hair. And um, frankly, the more I learned about anti-fascism, the more I realized I was an anti-fascist too. So to, to all you ladies, big scary Antifa over here. Um, I appreciated that about your approach, actually. I think in some ways you sort of call, you know, you call the bluff of journalists who claim to be objective by pointing out that really there is no way to be objective. And in fact, in many cases, being objective is a stance that is that can be problematic because it does lead to a sort of both sidedism that can be very dangerous in a lot of issues. Obviously, in this particular case, it's very clear how that plays out. I think in many issues, it's not as clear. But I think once you recognize that, in um in work like yours you can see how that how that um binary that's set up is really a false one uh, but but to get back to the antifa piece i think you know you talk about how um antifa is often misrepresented in the media and then and you do you know you really spend a while kind of trying to explain what it is so can you tell us a little bit about how you understand anti-fascist movements yeah, and for those of you curious about the book, uh, chapters nine and 10, Antifa Civil War and We Keep Us Safe are totally about the anti-fascist movement. Um, chapter nine is more specifically about debunking media myths um, and, and a little bit of a how the sausage is made look into the creation of those myths. Um, I think that, you know, 
as I write in the book, all things in nature are strained towards symmetry, but none more than mainstream media outlets. And so there's this desire to, you know, finally being forced to recognize that far right extremism is a threat to posit that there's an equal and opposite left wing threat or danger. Um, and if you just look at the facts on the ground, stuff like you know, the many, many reports on extremist murders that show that, you know, 96% of murders last year related to extremism were coming from the far right, that that's been true for years. Like there, there is no sense in which these, these, um, these movements are morally equivalent. And then add on to the fact that the fact that like one movement's goal is genocide and the other movement's goal is to protect communities against white supremacy. I mean, it really, sort of lays bare the kind of cynicism and mendacity of the, the media myths. Um, I actually spoke to and befriended and, um, you know, got to know a lot of anti-fascists and sort of became a part of that community um, as I was researching the book and even somewhat beforehand. Um, and I just want to say one thing that um, I think really a lot of people don't know, the, the sort of media image is like people dressed in black, uh, you know, wielding weapons and, and, and sort of setting out to do these street melees. That sort of, it's easy to say, ugh, both sides are gross, right? Um, so to that, I would say two things. One, uh, this sort of misrepresents the totality of what anti-fascism is. Uh, there are a lot of activities that, um, that go into anti-fascism and sort of street brawls are the last resort. Uh, anti-fascists do all kinds of things. So for example, a piece of anti-fascist work I did today was, um, you know, I was just like, I found a Ku Klux Klan recruitment website um, and through like a, an internet lookup, I found out who their host provider is, uh, their hosting provider and, and their domain registrar. And so I, you know, I'm lucky to have a large Twitter following and I, I wrote kind of, hey, I tagged the company host Gator and I said, do you know you're hosting a recruitment, a KKK recruitment website that goes against your terms of service in terms of, you know, uh, you have a term of service uh, saying that sites that encourage violence are not welcome on your, on your platform. And so um, just pointing that out, right. That's an act of anti-fascism, that kind of research. Um, of course, like outing and identifying individuals that are members of hate groups. For example, um, there's a wonderful account uh, that um, specifically focuses on uh, uh, fascism in the South um, that uncovered a man who was a middle school teacher uh, who posted under the username SC Nazi, South, Car South Carolina Nazi. And uh, you know, he was posting eliminationist, anti-Semitic, anti racist comments and teaching at a middle school that had a lot of black students. So anti-fascists pointed that out and, you know, he wound up getting fired and that's anti-fascist activity too. When it comes to countering far-right organizing, it's stuff like calling a hotel where a far-right conference is going to take place, letting them know, calling them out on social media, um, you know, and then finally, if and when an event can't be stopped ahead of time, it's saying, you know, with, with people like the Proud Boys, with, uh, with these militia groups, you know, with all uh, with neo-Confederate flaggers and different hate groups, a lot of what they do, I mean, when they get together, their goal is violence. They will attack bystanders who are visibly queer, who are, you know, visibly racial minorities, who are visibly Jewish, they will menace synagogues. And so what anti-fascists do, um, is say, we're going to put our bodies on the line. We're going to defend the community. Um, and we are going to ensure the safety of passersby and members of this community by attracting the violence towards us. Uh, and as to the masks, before masks became ubiquitous, a lot of that has to do with the fact that, you know, as we've seen portrayed in bright and living color all summer, but has become clearer and clearer, um, Law enforcement in the United States has a strong right-wing bias, a uh, standing friendliness with right-wing groups, as we've seen in the response to the police response or lack thereof to the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, the disproportionate response to left-wing protests and Black Lives Matter protests. 
Um, and the lack of response during the Capitol riot, uh, which had more than two dozen active duty police officers who were participants in the riot as well from all over the country. So when anti-fascists wear masks or seek to obscure their identities, a lot of that has to do with protecting themselves from the racist groups they're countering and law enforcement, which all too often feels like they're on the same team, unfortunately. So those are just two points about anti-fascism to make. That is really helpful. And we will get back to January 6th. I do want to talk about that um, because there's so much in your book that is really prescient. Um, But one of the things I want to talk about that I really appreciated about your book is that you explored and I felt explained very cogently the ways that racism, misogyny, and anti-Semitism are woven together in white supremacist ideology. And I think too often um, when people talk about white supremacy, we kind of oversimplify those things and we focus on only one of those threads. But of course, we can't really separate them. So can you tell us a little bit about how you came to understand how that tapestry, that dangerous tapestry works and what the role is of, you know, anti-Semitism and misogyny and racism within the ideology? Sure, I'll try to keep it tight and cogent. Um, But I really found myself exploring and delving into misogyny quite a bit. Um, And I actually wrote a chapter on uh, incels, involuntarily celibate men, as they call themselves, uh, who are, you know, it's really, they say it's about lack of sex. Any even cursory examination shows you it's a hate movement against women, Um, you know, and uh, an extremist form of misogyny. So I spent some time on that uh, in the book as well. Um, and, but, you know, I would say misogyny feeds the white supremacist movement, particularly online, uh, in two different ways. One, misogyny is sort of ambient in the culture uh, in ways I think all of us have felt. And as such, it serves as sort of an acceptable, say, gateway hatred um, for a lot of people. Um, these right-wing YouTube commentators that start out with sort of slickly produced anti-feminist comment, uh, uh, <clears throat> commentary and videos, stuff like, there's an all-female Ghostbusters, they're ruining your video games because they won't show more breasts, and feminists are ruining your life, um, offer a worldview in which a social justice-oriented, equity-oriented ideology is sort of oppressing you, the white man, the viewer. Um, you know, and some women are drawn to that message as well, you know, saying, oh, like, I also hate this world and have a raw deal. And uh, maybe that's because of feminism, right? But what that does is it offers you a class of people it's okay to harass, to wit feminists. And it offers you this mindset that, you know, this movement pushing towards equity is what is making me feel alienated and lost and confused. Um, And so once you've already got positioned someone there, um, it's much easier to introduce, but also, you know, uh, Black people, Jews, immigrants, these are also causing you to be in this station where you feel oppressed, left out, you know, uh, alienated. I'm not even going to say economically deprived because one of the myths um, that are very, very common about white supremacists is that they're all sort of dirt poor or cletuses without teeth in their mom's basement. And in fact, many of them are well-off professionals or bored suburban teens. Like it's really, there's no socioeconomic bracket that's immune from, from white supremacist ideology. Um, but anti-feminism is very, very often a starting point of the long and slippery, greasy slope um, down towards white supremacist ideology. And sort of part two of that is um, that the white supremacist worldview is very, very, very deeply misogynistic. Um, There's really an obsession with breeding uh, and this obsession with the idea of like, so one of the big conspiracy theories and the motivator behind, the direct motivation behind uh, the Pittsburgh synagogue shooting in 2018 uh, is the great replacement theory. This idea that uh, nefarious Jews are, (laughs) importing immigrants who have wildly high birth rates in order to outbreed white people. And so they see the role of white women in the movement as to breed um, chastely 
uh, you know, to be under the control of the, her husband and uh, ultimately to produce enough white babies to stave off the dilution of the white race by, by um, rapidly breeding immigrants. I mean, it's very stark, it's very retrograde. There is an obsession with gender roles, uh, with a kind of uh, like heterosexual masculinity that's drawn from like the Vikings and the Knights Templar. It's very, it's so retrograde, it's not even post enlightenment. Uh, and um, the idea of regressing back, to defeating feminism and regressing back to a pre feminist set of gender roles and tamping down women's freedom is a humongous part of the ideology um, in the white supremacist movement. And also that sentiment is very, very common across the entirety of the right. The idea that, um, you know, feminism, uh, trans rights, gay rights, uh, these are all movements, you know, designed to subvert traditional gender roles, destroy the nuclear family and uh, make white people less fertile. Um, whether they say explicitly that it's a Jewish plot or not depends on the flavor of white extremists you're looking at. <laughs> so then where does the Jew fit into all of that? That's a great question. Uh, <laughs> no, and I actually, uh, I see that there's a question about, um, uh, so first of all, to, to Stephanie uh, de Kaiser's question, yes, the trad wife movement is very deeply tied to all of this. There are definitely women who strongly identify as the ideal anti-feminist uh, white wife who's producing babies. Um, on that topic, I recommend Sayward Darby's wonderful book, um, which is recent uh, Sisters in Hate um, that explores the trad wife movement uh, and women's trad role in white supremacy. Traditional, traditional, trad is traditional, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so know. one of the women that Sayward talks about is, uh, Ayla Stewart, AKA a wife with a purpose who has six kids and is very white supremacist and just a nasty character all around. Um, but someone asked me about Marjorie Taylor Greene <laughs> um, and her lovely Jewish space lasers, the Rothschilds are nefariously controlling the world theory uh, in addition to all of her other theories. So I think uh, I wanna address that directly and just say, uh, you know, first of all, not a big fan. But second of all, her theory of nefarious Jewish world control, along with her assorted other bigotries, including eliminationist Islamophobia, deep racism, you know, the fact that these are paired are, is not coincidental. So within the world of like neo-Nazis and the white supremacists that I explored, um, what the Jew, the Jew serves two rhetorical functions. One, um, and I'm talking about like, course they can and do target individual Jews of all kinds uh my yours truly included um although I control little beyond my own wardrobe and frankly that's even a function of uh laundry um but their conception of the Jew the Urwiga Judah the the eternal Jew uh is really a very convenient fiction as Jean-Paul Sartre put it in 1948 if the Jew did not exist, the anti-Semite would invent him. Uh, and that has to do with, um, so I, I, just to boil it down very, very simply, I have a chapter that I worked really hard on about the whole history of anti-Semitism in America boiled down into one chapter. So if you're curious, it's, it's laid out there in much more detail. But uh, in essence, the Jew serves two rhetorical functions in the white supremacist worldview. Uh, so number one is, as sort of a, an intellectual framework for why the world is the way it is, why the world is degenerate, why the world is decayed, why the pure white social order has been subverted. So, uh, you know, this is a deeply racist movement. They start from the premise that people of color uh, cannot organize for their own civil rights because they're simply too stupid, docile and incapable. So Jewish rights, uh, civil rights are a Jewish plot. Uh, any movement for racial equity is a Jewish plot. Feminism is a Jewish plot to destroy white fertility. Trans rights is a Jewish plot to destroy white fertility. Gay rights is a Jewish plot to destroy white fertility on and on and on. Uh, and of course, any social inequity, you know, they sometimes will exploit people who are 
uh, you know, feeling like society is unfair because it is, and and you know, offer up a kind of light version of uh, anti-Semitism as the socialism of fools. Uh, you know, the reason why things are unfair and you feel poor and you don't like your bank account is because of Jews. So that's another piece of it. So the rhetor one rhetorical function is to explain why everything's so fucked up to them and why they need to fight back. The second rhetorical function, and this is intimately married with the theory of Jewish world control, is the idea that, um, that you know, it's very hard prima facie to make the argument that white men are the most oppressed group in America. Um, <laughs> You know, we have had one president who is not a white man in our history. Uh, and yet, um, in order to arrive at that place, you essentially need to invent a foe who is more well-resourced, who is more cunning, who is sort of infinitely wealthy and infin infinitely malevolent. And once you have done that rhetorical work, you can position yourself as sort of a brave fighter against injustice, against impossible odds, against the sort of seemingly unconquerable forces of Jewish control. And that's uh, how white supremacists see themselves. Very few people see themselves as villains, although some people, you know, the, the especially online corners of the movement do sometimes see themselves as trolls. Um, but the way people justify it, see themselves as fighters for rights and justice and peace, is the idea of that this, the white race is being oppressed by the evil Jew who is infinitely cunning, infinitely powerful, infinitely malicious, infinitely malevolent, and infinitely resourced. So, you know, we serve as both catch all explanation and infinitely powerful foe that they are bravely fighting against. So we have a bunch of questions that I think are really important about the relationship between white privilege and white supremacy and the whiteness of white Jews and sort of how that all works together. So if you could, I know this is, these are very large questions and also sort of get at, I think, distinguishing a little bit between the white supremacist ideology of the far right you were studying and sort of the ways that white supremacy is a kind of baseline culture in America. Um, but also maybe a little bit, you know, thinking about the ways that the whiteness of white Jews is threatening to white supremacists. Can you talk a little bit about some of that stuff? Yeah, absolutely. I'm just going to open my window for a second because I am busy uh, as I try to talk and gesticulate fast enough. So one second. My apologies. Uh, letting in that beautiful winter air, my, my apologies. So, um, so uh, okay, big questions. <laughs> I think it, actually it was hard. It was hard as I was sitting and writing the book, of like, where do I stop with the white supremacist movement? And, you know, once you start seeing all the ways that American society is premised on racism, it's like really, really hard to just like stop at a certain point. Um, so many things in America are premised on racism, uh, from our carceral system to, you know, our school system, like, uh, to like crazy things like, like, systematically in redlined neighborhoods, like neighborhoods that have been redlined in the past, there are less trees and like, like it's hotter in the summer. I mean, just the degree in which like America is environmentally and ideologically shaped by racism is like boggling to contemplate cannot fit into one book. Um, and so what I set out to write about was like specifically the sort of radical white supremacist fringe, arguably, no, actually not arguably. Um, like the broader wages of white supremacy in America have a much higher death toll year on year than the people I'm writing about. But I do think it's important to understand them and to defeat them because, and also to, to understand them because the ideas they espouse are just the, are like the bleeding edge of stuff that certainly forms the mainstream of the Republican party at the moment. Um, you know, they're always one degree, they're like one step forward from where the right is right now. And having an extreme allows the mainstream to distinguish itself and say, we're not that, so you can't call us white supremacists because we're not Nazis. So there's a way in which the the extreme right allows the like acceptance or the kind of mainstreaming of some white supremacy in a milder form in, you know, in the center. 
Yeah. Oh yeah. It's, it's, it's an, it, that's absolutely true. And, um, you know, I think the people that I, I will also say that like understanding the thought patterns and theories, um, of the people I was writing about helped me understand like the broader thought patterns behind white supremacy and racism in general. There are, you know, are things that apply to both. There are rationales that both embrace, you know, you might not be a vocal proponent of the great replacement theory of white dilution, but you can talk about birth rates as a reason to not want immigration. And that's more common than you think. So being able to know the white supremacist friend pretty intimately helped me understand, I would say, like some of the, how some of the rationales are the same, um, you know, even in the more moderate uh, factions of the right. Um, so that's one uh, piece of it. As to whiteness and white Jews. Well, I look like this. Uh, I'm not gonna be stopped by a cop for being black. Uh, I'm not going to be racially profiled in the airport. Uh, I'm not going to be, I, I have skin privilege, right? Face privilege, um, but the color of my skin is uh, white. And that is not to be discounted. You know, there's been a big brouhaha among the um, Barry Weisses of the world about calling white Jews white. I think it's fair to say that we are. That being said, uh, the big white supremacist worldview piece of this is that we have assimilated into whiteness in order to destroy it from within. That there's a conditional whiteness that Jews have that can, the canon should be revoked. Um, and that we are the sort of eminence gris seeking to, like that we have sort of nefariously inf um, infiltrated whiteness in order to, uh, you know, like uh, systematically take it apart and dismantle it from within. Um, and so one really piquant example of that was a telegram channel with thousands of subscribers that I believe still exists. Um, and uh, it's called The Noticer. And it's, again, like going back to what I talked about before um, about, uh, yeah, The Noticer, still active and it has 12,000 subscribers um, on Telegram. And so what they do is find um, people who are Jewish, who say, on so who talk on social media about white privilege, who talk about racism. And they will post images and the Twitter handles or social media handles of Jewish people that they say are saying they're white um, and signal and target them for harassment. Um, it's called the noticer because again, it's this theme of sort of, we're noticing what you're doing, how you're trying to get away with it, even though you think you're so sly. So that's just an example of like, you know, it was a very vivid example and I've had people reach out to me and said, I've been targeted by this, this channel. Suddenly I'm getting all this harassment from neo-Nazis saying I should jump in an oven, what should I do? And um, unfortunately that kind of conversation is one I've had with all too many people, mostly women uh, for the last couple of years. There are a lot of questions um, about sort of what this experience was like for you. And, and I was thinking about that too, in terms of the personal cost, both in terms of physical safety, but also in terms of psychological safety. And you write a lot in the book about how to do this work, you, you needed to leave your identity behind and you know really inhabit a hate a, a person who was a, a, you know filled with hate and immerse yourself in that so you know how did you um first of all keep yourself and your family safe while doing this work how did you keep yourself sane um we have a question about whether there was a point any point at which you felt you you know might not be able to make it back out that you were really in danger either physically or um you know just in terms of your own mental health well, bold to assume I made it out sane. Um, I think we're all struggling right at this very moment to keep a hold on our sanity. Uh, certainly I will say like, it, it gives you a bit of a jaundiced view of the world and you know, waking up in the morning and reading channels called Holocaust 2 and murder the media and going to sleep with murder the media on my phone, right? Or like, you know, it, in sort of a 
relatively harrowing incident that, that I uh, uh, recounted at the beginning of chapter one, uh, eavesdropping on a neo-Nazi chat room that I, they didn't know I was there and they were talking about uh, whether I was too ugly to rape. I mean, that stuff really imprints itself in your mind. Uh, but let's say, first of all, I had some really dark periods. Like it was a rough year. It, it's still rough sometimes. I'm still engaged in um, the, uh, the work. Um, I've, I've just uh, started working with a wonderful new organization called Deep Platform Hate, uh, which I'm gonna put our website uh, in the chat room here, deepplatformhate.org, um, that works to uh, hold tech companies to account for hosting um, hate sites and uh, pro uh, propagandists for racism and anti-Semitism on social media. Um, I'm still doing the work. It is still hard. Um, the ways I keep myself safe. I mean, I have like a set of digital and physical safety protocols. I've had the FBI come to my door about death threats they've seen about me. Um, we don't have our name on the door. Uh, in fact, there was a really broke my heart. There was a debate about whether to take the mizzes off the door. And that was really tough for me. And we kept it up because fuck them. Um, but you know, that that was even a debate for my family, like really crushed me. I mean, it's really hard. Like you make the choice to engage in this work. Your family doesn't, right? They, they just chose to give birth to me, um, unfortunately uh, for them. And I, uh, I, I have a, um, I signed up for a program that, that scrubs my data from data broker websites. If you ever engage in this kind of, um, work, I strongly recommend it. It's called delete me, join delete me.com. Um, it will scrub your website, your address and phone number from, you know, white pages and all those scuzzy data brokers. Um, so that's one of the safety tips I engaged in. I never tag photos when I'm out of place. I wait till I've been gone for several hours. I obscure my location very deliberately. It's hard. I mean, you're always living under the shadow of kind of this fear. But on the other hand, I mean, as I have said before, I am angrier than I am afraid and more determined than I am angry. I think this movement is possible to beat and it takes a lot of us showing a lot of courage um, and standing out in an uncompromising way against hate and racism when we see it, including racism in the Jewish community, which is a huge and ongoing problem. And uh, answer to a smaller question, I love Sasha Baron Cohen. And um, I really like the Borat movies. And I thought Borat 2 is pretty awesome because mocking white supremacists is still worthwhile. As long as you don't dismiss them as like, um, first of all, as long as you don't hew to the stereotype that they're all ignorant and, un and, un and uneducated, which um, I think often is a self-absolution tactic. It couldn't be on my street, in my HOA, in my PTA. Um, but like, yeah, they're often ridiculous. You can mock them. I think that's great. And humor has always been a Jewish weapon when we wield it effectively. Um, yeah. Um, so the yeah. <laughs> question about, you know, you mentioned in the book that it was harder to infiltrate women's white supremacist organizations. Why, why is that? They're a little less dumb and testosterone fueled. Um, more than that, there are different, it's a much smaller, it's a smaller community and a more tight knit community. The trad wife sort of white women's crew and even say we're Darby's book, which focuses uh, exclusively on these women kind of wound up having sort of hostile subjects um, in the end. And uh, um, a lot of them, like there are certain, parts of the white supremacist world. I've done a fair number of undercover operations at this point, and there will be a point where they ask you to show up on video, to show up on camera. Have you been to this place? Can anyone vouch for you in person? And that's the point where, you know, if you're hiding under an identity, if you are, you know, I can't show up. To... Enough people know my name and face that I can't like show up physically to say a militia training um, or like a white women's, I don't know, coffee club. If I were blonde and stick thin and look like a trad wife. Maybe that would be different, but I don't. I have my Ashkenazi heritage written all over my skin, um, which I'm mostly proud of, to be honest. Um, but, uh, you know, 
so yeah, it was just about like, no one can physically vouch for you. We'd like to include you, but you know, sadly no one's seen you at one of our, whatever they call it, coffee clutches. <laughs> um, so that was why it was harder to penetrate. So the book was published in October and presumably you wrote most of it before the pandemic. Um, so how would you, you know, what has changed since then? You know, what has the impact of the pandemic been of the racial protests and of January 6th? Where do you think we are now? And I will say again that, you know, the book, it was eerie to read the book now, you know, post January 6th, because so much of what you talk about, like the connection between law enforcement and white nationalist groups was so much, you know, played out so obviously in that moment. Um, how are you seeing the world in this moment? Um, yeah, I mean, it's unfortunate when you're writing a book about current events, especially I was like, something big is going to happen with white supremacy in America in 2020, right? But you, you have to get your book out. At a certain point, you have to stop writing. Um, and, you know, uh, because I did stop writing, it was out in the world before January 6th. So there's a trade-off, right? Um, I will say a couple things about the pandemic, first of all. Uh, a lot of people found themselves, and stop me if this sounds familiar, a lot more isolated with a lot more time online, um, with a lot less social cohesion, connection, busyness. A lot of people fell down rabbit holes in that time. That fed mostly the QAnon movement. Um, a lot of sort of COVID-19 denialism, vaccine, fear-mongering um, fed the QAnon movement more than any other right-wing tendency, but all the right-wing tendencies that are sort of marinated in conspiracy grew. Of course, QAnon itself is a deeply anti-Semitic and racist movement. Um, I think QAnon is very often uh, dismissed as sort of wacky, uh, and it is, it's very outlandish, um, but I think people lose sight of the essential violence of the movement. Uh, you know, the culminating fantasy that Q and Donald Trump and uh, is supposed to usher in is, um, very, very similar to the culminating fantasy of the Turner Diaries, the sort of neo-Nazi uh, 1978 um, or novel that sort of inspired Timothy McVeigh directly. Uh, the, the, the culminating fantasy of QAnon uh, is the, the great awakening. Um, it's the moment when Democrats, celebrities, um, some establishment Republicans that have been insufficiently loyal to Donald Trump um, will be rounded up, will be subject to perfunctory military tribunals, and then executed for treason. The day of the rope, for comparison, in Turner Diaries is when white women in interracial relationships, Jews, journalists, and Black activists, Black men in general, are rounded up and hung. Stop me if that rhymes to you. They're very similar. So uh, the pandemic um, grew the conspiracy movements a lot, uh, especially Q. Um, the racial justice movement and protests um, inspired um, some anti-government activists, uh, members of the nascent Boogaloo movement to come out of the woodwork with their guns, uh, including um, the young teenager Kyle Rittenhouse who killed two protesters in Kenosha, Wisconsin over the summer and is currently um, under an arrest warrant for failing to update his address to the court um, as we speak. So, and um, as for January 6th, I mean, it rhymed a little bit um, it, with uh, Unite the Right in Charlottesville in that it was uh, a physical presence of lots of different tendencies of the far right. So you had QAnon, you had militias, you had you know, Nazis, including uh, Tim Baked Alaska Gionne, who was arrested after live streaming himself in Nancy Pelosi's office, um, who's a documented you know, Nazi, members of the Proud Boys. You had like people from lots of di different segments of the far right all showing up together physically. And as was the case at Unite the Right, the result was deadly violence. Um, I think that's as clean a demonstration I can give as any rhetoric I can issue in the book um, that this is a movement premised on leading to and uh, 
drawn to violence as a hummingbird is to nectar. We have some questions about deplatforming. That's something obviously you've talked about um, and that some of your work has helped do and something that's been in the news a lot since January 6th as, you know, Trump and various other folks are kicked off of Twitter and some organizations have been kicked or some platforms have been kicked off of Amazon. How do you think about about the, um, you know, the ways in which deplatforming can drive extremists into harder to find places? Um, I'm a big fan of deplatforming. Like I said, I work with this nonprofit, Deplatform Hate. Um, there is sometimes an argument that, oh, isn't it just playing whack-a-mole? Oh, doesn't it just make it harder for researchers? First of all, the people making it uh, harder for researchers are social media companies like Facebook that have constantly refused any kind of transparency and have purposely thwarted research into their the patterns of uh, user extremism. Um, second of all, every time you whack-a-mole, every time you deplatform a service or a person or a YouTube channel, you make it that much harder for people to find it, that much harder for people to get radicalized. And inevitably, some people will say it's not worth it. It's not worth the bother. Ugh, ugh, I have to download another app. I mean, sometimes like we'll do that for something as simple as like, you know, I don't know, I don't want to have to download another app to get like this pair of shoes I like. Well, you know, people apply the same logic to extremist ideology. And if even one person is turned away by a deplatforming, then it's worth it. Um, so that's my take. That's my quick, facile take on deplatforming. As to slippery slope and free speech concerns, uh, I will address those once people who openly advocate for genocide are cleaned off platforms. Thank you very much. Um, uh, and two, uh, there's so many awesome questions here and I really wish I had like time to answer them all. I mean, of course, like there's a huge overlap between white nationalists and anti-government folks. Uh, like you should check out the sovereign citizen movement. Um, if you, you know, you're curious, just Google them. That's a big overlap site. Uh, how to influence white supremacists. Oh boy, I talked to someone else who wants to talk to them. I, I think they should become pariahs who are socially shamed. And, and that's my big, uh, that's my big take that we need to reimpose a social co uh, cost to racism, including in the Jewish community. Yes, I know there were Jews for Trump that showed up to the Capitol on July 6th. And first of all, it, the far right is capacious and has many tendencies and Jews can march alongside Nazis sometimes. But second of all, we really need to take a big look at racism in our communities and say, no, because it does all come from the same wellspring. If nothing else, out of self-interest, we should fight them um, because it will redound against us in the end. So that racist guy at Shoal, who's like always posting shady stuff about black people, time to have a deep conversation with your Shoal about whether he should be allowed to have an Aliyah anymore. <laughs> uh, um, but you know, most of all, I, I say to everyone, just to wrap up, because I unfortunately have to run to another event. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me, Judith, and these wonderful questions. I wish I could answer them all. Um, and uh, um, the book is available anywhere books are sold. Um, the bookshop.org helps support indie bookstores during a very difficult time for them. And, you know, if you're, I think that all of us should be anti-fascists in this moment and start where you are start where you live um, and look at who in your town is making the, the loudest noise uh, in the ugliest way about Jews, about black people, um, about people of color and immigrants and check that person out. See if they're tied to any uh, organized hate groups and see if maybe their employer should know about it. That's all it takes. If you've stayed up all night surfing in X's Instagram you have the talent and all the skills necessary to dox a Nazi. I believe in you and I love you. Thank you so much, Talia, for, um, for being with us tonight, for answering so many questions, for, and for pulling back the veil on some of the most disturbing elements of American culture and challenging us not to look away, uh, inspiring us to do this work. Um, go on to your next event. Thank you for writing this book. Everyone should buy this book and read it. It's really beautiful in addition to being 
just smart and illuminating. Um, and I encourage you all to read it. And I want to thank all of you for engaging in this important conversation. And, um, and I hope we will be able to continue this conversation in many ways. So thank, thank you. you. Take care. Good night. Good night. Bye. And for everyone else, I hope you will join us next week, same time, same place, for a different kind of talk. We're going to be doing a special book talk with Professor Jody Eichler-Levine on Judaism and crafting. And the evening will include a special add-on optional crafting project, which we will introduce at the end of the program with the artists who developed it. And we will send you a step-by-step -step instructional video so you can do it on your own time at your own pace. Um, it should be a fun way for those of you who are crafty to engage very uh, tactically in some of the ideas that we'll be discussing. And I look, in, I look forward to seeing you all then. Um, and in the meantime, I encourage you to check out the many, many resources we have in our digital archive at jwa.org, uh, from online exhibits to an encyclopedia to a podcast, a multi-generational blog on which you will find the Ask Emma advice column. Um, we and a review of Talia's book uh, and conversations about a lot of these issues. We have so much material to discover, help you gain insight uh, about the diversity of the Jewish story. So thank you all for being here tonight, for engaging in this important conversation. And until next time, thank you, be well, and have a lovely evening. Good night, everyone.